All right, everybody. For today's industry insight, we got a very interesting topic. I want to talk about the contradiction of the adults only rating when it comes to the video game industry. Now, this past week or so, there's been several big news pieces surrounding this. Probably the one most people know about is the game uh, School Shooting Simulator that was basically a shovelware title that, as the name implies, I think you can guess what it does. And it was released on Steam. They paid the uh, Steam direct fee and so on and so forth. It got on. And then it started to break news among major YouTubers and sites. And Valve struck down the ban hammer on it. Now, another game that came out lately was a Kickstarter title by the name of, I think, Agony. This is a game about being in hell. And it was heavily promoted as being an adults-only affair with... So many disturbing and graphic imageries that I can't say here. But when the game was released, after they got a publisher, it was toned down to get an M rating. And a lot of people felt that, that betrayed the original promise. And when it comes to talking about adults only or very graphic or controversial titles, it always becomes a very gray area. Especially when it comes to video games, which again occupy that space between entertainment and art. When School Shooting Simulator was taken off, you of course heard the same uh, phrases from both sides. You had people saying, good, this game is vile, must be removed, and so on and so forth. And then you have defenders saying, free speech is being violated, it's the SJWs at work, and again, blah, blah, blah. But... When it comes to the ESRB and the adults-only rating, it's kind of been a non-rating for as long as I can remember. And when it comes to adults-only, basically the idea is, if your game is rated that, yes, you can certainly make a game that's adults-only, but no store will stock it, so you can't actually sell it. And most of the major retailers from GameStop, Walmart, Target, Amazon, and so forth, usually have strict rules when it comes to content along those lines. And this was especially true of the 90s when we didn't have access to internet shopping. So what this meant was for developers who tried to push the envelope back then, it never really caught on. And doing a quick Wikipedia search before I recorded this, there is an estimate, I believe, 28 games right now that have been marked adults only. Few of them you probably know, like Hatred, and of course the vast majority of them are have some kind of form of sex or porn in the title, and I think you know why that's considered adult only. But whenever we talk about graphic or controversial content, it always raises some very interesting discussions, especially when it comes of comes to freedom of expression. Like we said a few minutes ago, the game industry is both art and a product. And the art side allows developers to tell very unique and interesting stories that have broken grounds in a lot of ways. And you can see this with how rapidly the game industry has evolved over the last 30 years. We've gone from an era where the original Castlevania game couldn't show the Holy Cross as a weapon because it would be considered too risque for Christian uh, believers, to today when we have games like uh, Dream Daddy, Firewatch, Gone Home, and even titles like The Last of Us and God of War that not only have graphic violence, but deal with emotional stories and what it means to be a father. And again, this kind of stuff wouldn't have happened 15, 20 years ago. And that's one of the big points and why a lot of people have trouble with rating systems and classifying or classifying games like this. One Every country ha or every region in the world has its own strict limits and what they find acceptable. And two, as years go by, the needle gets moved forward or gets moved up every so often. And what that means is as more things come out that kind of push that envelope and make people sort of question things, it opens the door to allow other people to do things similar. Now, not everybody is going to make the next Casablanca or Lord of the Rings and so on. And for those movies, there's stuff like Sharknado, Birdnado, and I'm sure many, many more than you can think of. 
But the point is, whenever we have talk about censorship or immediately uh, stopping any taboo topics, it causes these issues to come to light. And to give you an example of this, when it came to television, television has come a very long way from its inception back in, oh god, I get to show how horrible I am at history, I want to say 40s, maybe early 50s, but again, I'll leave that to people who have studied that to correct me. But the point is, early television was very advertiser and ad-driven. Basically, the show couldn't do anything that the advertiser didn't want, and of course, you had to have advertisements in it. This is why so many shows of the 40s and 50s had cigarette uh, advertisers, cigarette breaks, which that's something we don't see today. But flash forward to today, and many people have decried the last decade being almost, or even more than that, the golden age of television. With everything from shows like Game of Thrones, Mad Men, uh, Legion, The Americans, Fargo, um, uh, The Wire, Breaking Bad, and I'm sure many more that you can that you probably know of. And the, what's very interesting is when we look at kind of the span of television from back then to where we are today, you can see how various shows again move that needle, whether it was by inches or by feet. We can go from stuff like Game of Thrones back to stuff like The Wire and Breaking Bad. We can go even further back to shows like uh, South Park and Family Guy. We could even talk about sitcoms in the 90s like Seinfeld, Friends, Ellen. We could go back further to stuff like The Simpsons, Married with Children. And we could keep going back and seeing how things were tracked. But the point is... It's always, you have to leave that door open. And this is why I feel that there should be allowed to have adults-only games, especially today, considering how far we've come. And you've probably been noticing this, which I'm going to take that phone. I'll be right back. All right, and we're back. It's also getting darker here, so we got to finish this up soon. But as I was saying, as you can track how television evolved over the last 50, 60 years, this brings me to my little example right here. This is my collection of The Twilight Zone, one of my all-time favorite shows. And this is, wow, a lot of DVDs in here. But the point is, when it comes to television, I'm turning this back in the shot, when it comes to television that really has pushed that needle, science fiction has been one of the strongest proponents of that, dating back to The Twilight Zone, Star Trek, and even shows like Doctor Who in the 60s. But when it comes to The Twilight Zone, I remember I was watching this in the DVD set of an interview Rod Sterling game. I think this was 1958-1959. It was on a syndicated, syndicated talk show. And he discussed about how he wanted The Twilight Zone to be essentially an open platform for science fiction authors to tell whatever stories they wanted without fear of, you know, advertisers pulling out, being considered too risque, too controversial, because he didn't want those voices to be silenced. And he gave a really good point about how everybody has their own reason or their own determination about what's considered too mature. And he gave a story about how he was watching Lassie with his children and there was an episode where Lassie gave birth to puppies, and he thought it was one of the most beautiful things he ever saw. But the network had to take that episode off the air because someone complained that, you know, it was too immoral for their background. And this is why, uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm always against people saying that you can't tell a story, you can't do something. Because if you want there to be true creativity, Everything has to be on the table. It can't be a pick-and-choose affair. And even when it comes to controversial topics, because, again, controversy today doesn't mean controversy in five to ten years from now. And stuff that is considered normal now probably wouldn't have been done, again, in the last decade or so. And as another really big example of this, the independent scene, as one of the more interesting aspects of how far it's come, 
has really had a huge following and huge support for LGBT related stories and characters. Again, I mentioned the game Dream Daddy earlier, but there are plenty, and I do mean plenty of games that deal with topics of sexuality along those lines. Many of those probably aren't going to be seen in Target, Walmart, and the like. And some of, probably a lot of them aren't even on Steam these days. But the point is, and this is one of the things that a lot of uh, people who defend uh, controversial games will say, is that it's okay to have graphic violence and murder, but if you want to talk about sex, it's considered taboo. Or vice versa when it comes to a lot of independent games or when people complain about violence. Saying that, oh, you're fine with having, you know, a man sleeping with a man or a woman sleeping with a woman, but you complain when someone gets, you know, stabbed, shot, cut, so on and so forth. But to begin to wrap things up, when it comes to the idea of adults only or very controversial titles or designs, I think that there needs to be a forum for it. And again, as we've talked about before, are we expecting an AO game to be making Call of Duty, World of Warcraft, or uh, Breath of the Wild numbers? No, it, it's not going to do that. That's just the nature of the market. And again, about what it means to push this needle. But in order for games to tell meaningful stories about these issues, they have to remain on the table. Now, going back to the topic that kind of started this with the school shooting simulator, again, it raises that question, could you do a game that does justice to it? We've talked about this before with the idea that whenever you try to reference a real-life event or tragedy, there's always that line you have to walk between being able to uh, show things convinc convincingly versus glorifying it or trying to exploit it for profit. Now, I know someone's about to comment below and say that when it comes to the game industry, any topic, if you're good enough, should be able to be told. I think someone said that on the last time we talked about this. But again, it raises that question. How? Is it, how do you do something along these lines that is not seen as glorifying? It's a lot harder than doing a shovelware game. And again, when it comes to this idea, a lot of the games that do push those boundaries seem to be more on the lesser quality side. And we've yet to see like a true double A or triple A game really approach things from that, you know, a pushing that needle forward. I mean, in a small sense, we could argue that the Persona series have done things with having openly gay characters in it. But again, it always has to come back to moving that needle. Because whether it's a little bit or a lot, this is how things grow as a medium and being able to tell stories. Again, you may like games like Gone Home, The Last of Us, God of War, and so on. But if it wasn't for games like Mortal Kombat, Super Mario World, or even something like the original Resident Evil, these games wouldn't exist to begin with. And that's a big part about game development. The best games that are released don't exist in a vacuum. 2017 was one of the best years the industry has seen in a long time, and that didn't just happen magically. It came because of a lot of games that have been developed, and again, a lot of that time spent iterating and refining, but that's a topic for another day. So we're going to wrap things up here. Thank you so much for watching today's Industry Insight. Hope you enjoyed my little prop there, and be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here, and on Game Wisdom, where we of the art and science of games. If you have a topic for a future piece you'd like me to cover, please let me know. Hopefully, uh, I hope you enjoyed this little dark discussion here, both figuratively and literally, and I will see you guys next time. Before we get to the credits, just want to give a quick shout out to the fans and supporters over on patreon.com slash GWBicer. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. If you like to suggest games for me to cover or topics to talk about, let me know in the comments below. For a collection of my writings as well as weekly podcasts on design, check out game-wisdom.com. To support the Game Wisdom Patreon, you can find us on there on patreon.com slash gwbicer. A dollar will get you into our private Discord channel where we talk game topics and more. Five dollars will get you 
voting privileges for any major event, including the Saturday Night Grab Bag, Patreon funded goals, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I hope you enjoy more videos here on the Game Wisdom YouTube channel.